put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean, he shall dwell alone. Without the king shall his habitation be. Now that's a horrible lot. If you, read, if you look at those two verses, and we can see why it would end in death, so to speak. But anyway, what he's talking about here, describing leprosy, the first word that is important is the word plague. Because when I think of a plague, I think of like the Black Plague in England, in, in Europe. You think of other plagues we just went through. We, we are in a plague right now, so to speak. So Jesus, or in the Bible, when we're writing this, we describe leprosy as a plague. And it suggests that it is um, uh, considered a divine affliction. Being dressed, and this is what you, this is the way you were identified. <clears throat> you were dressed in torn clothes. You had to have a facial covering over your face. We were familiar with that, and you had you uncovered your head, and that was associated with mourning. Also, adding to that trauma part, the law of Moses required the afflicted person that if you first off you had to stay away from people, but if someone approached you, you had to cry out unclean, and they all knew what that meant. So they would not even come near you, okay? Then it says this prevented the person from having any uh, communal um, activities. He could not attend any functions. Family members could not be home. And it said that they would have to come out and feed them, leave them food, that they couldn't even be there to handle the food to them. So they were excluded from all activities of a community. Goes on to say, now I like this word too, you're not, it's not only a plague, you're also defiled. That's even worse. And therefore, that person had to be quarantined. And the way they were quarantined, they were just told to go live out there in the woods, so to speak. I mean, they had to stay away from everybody. So at that time, the law was given. Those with leprosy had to live outside the camp. And they also forced being ostracized socially. And that simply meant no participation in weddings, funerals, synagogue meetings, and certainly no temple activities. They, they could not even come in to worship. They were totally alone. So even though I say they're alone, and we're going to look at in Luke, and there's 10 of them, you could have a leper colony. They could all get together and associate that way, and that's what these 10 are. They're all lepers. So they could be together that way, but they couldn't come into any family or anything else. So that is a horrible situation. Now, from that part in the Old Testament, Jesus gives us our lesson in the New Testament today. So we transition to Luke starting in chapter 17, verse 11. And our story today is what Jesus will do with the 10 lepers. So we'll start with verse 11 through uh, 13. And Carol, do you mind reading all three of those? And he came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village where he met 10 men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The bulk of our lesson today comes from Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem, uh, choosing a route that crossed areas where Samaritans might have, he might have encountered. The shortest distance from town in, Jer in, Jer in Galilee to Jerusalem in Judea would be to go through Samar Samaria. But we know that most Galilean Jews took the longer route they walked around that area and to get from one place to another, and they simply avoided Samaria. So Jesus, he took a direct, path, uh, direct route. He did not exclude. And we've seen, as I said, we've seen this before, where he has talked to the woman at the well and other. He will go there, but it's on his way from one point A to point B, and he's not going to divert. He's going to go straight through, and he will encounter uh, the, these ten men. It goes on to say, as Jesus reached the edge of a certain village, we don't know the town. It's just from these two areas. We don't know the name of it. But anyway, he encounters a band of ten men that were lepers who had lived banished lives, and they were ready to meet him. And they can tell you here that uh, they're ready to meet him because Jesus had been healing and doing miracles. So I'm sure his family members would leave food for their family members of these ten men. They've heard the stories. So they are waiting, and they are anticipating, and sometimes we don't do either one. We don't wait, and we don't anticipate what God can do. But they are, they are, they realize that Jesus is coming. They just can't come close to him. So it's the fact that these men stood far off, they know the law of Moses. Now, the one thing they did not do 
look what they say. We read in Leviticus that if anyone approached you, you had to shout out unclean. But look what they say in verse 13. They say, Jesus, Master. And this Master can mean teacher, but this Master can also mean God's divinity. Jesus' divinity. He is God in the flesh. So they say, Master, have mercy on us. Now, a teacher can't have mercy. Well, I guess you could have mercy, but not in this sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess you, you, know, you do have to. You do sometimes. But anyway, but in this sense, well, put it this way. I can't give you mercy in a, in a way, not the way he's talking. They want mercy, and this mercy is when God gave it to all of us, he gave us healing. And that's what they're asking for, this kind of mercy that can only come from God. So they do call, they, this is what they say. So they say, Jesus master have mercy on us not that we're unclean okay they did not approach jesus choosing instead to shout at him from a distance and jesus could hear that shout and he didn't go up to him and touch him either and also when they use the word master it tells you here that it was a term of respect a, defer, a term of deference which implied they knew they had some knowledge of jesus but as i said <laughs> Only God can truly give us mercy. It goes on to say that their focus was on a plea for mercy, which is divine favor, favor in telling God's healing. The men with leprosy saw Jesus as a conduit of God's grace and mercy. Think of that tree out there and you got the sap in between. That's a conduit. So Jesus is the conduit physically on earth to God the Father in heaven. Because we know that anytime Jesus did anything, he always stopped and did what first? Pray to the Father. He tells us, I can do nothing except what I see the Father, what the Father has done. So he always stops there. And also it goes on, because he, he, they, see, they see him as a conduit, their preparedness of this band of desperate men indicate that Jesus' rival was expected and eagerly anticipated. They know where they can get healing. The question is, will they get healing? And then the question is, what kind of healing do they get? Because there's two kinds of healing. One is physical and one is spiritual. Or do one of them get both? And we'll see. He got both. Okay? Tell you the little end of the story. All right, verse 14. Uh, Joyce, do you mind reading 14? And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. So Jesus' immediate response was not to heal them. You know, sometimes he's spitting the dirt and put uh, dirt on someone's eyes or whatever. Sometimes, he, like the woman with the issue of blood, she just touched his garment. She was healed instantly. Jesus does none of that. He says, go, show yourself to the priest. Now, that goes back to Leviticus. They could not come in back into community until the priest said you were clean. So, Jesus is following in that point the law, if you go with that. So, Jesus instructed them to seek such certification before they were healed though he spoke as though it had already happened however i think this is a key point he said what what was the very first word jesus said to these men he said go if they had not gone started toward the priests they would not have been healed they had to follow his command and he said go and as they went that leprosy just disappeared. But they had to go to the priest so the priest could declare them clean, therefore they could re be reestablished in the community. But <coughs> if, if these men did not go, they would not have been healed. So they had to listen to what Jesus was saying. It goes on to tell you here that these ten men with leprosy were not healed until they began to make their way to the priest as Jesus commanded. It didn't go away when Jesus said, be healed. It went away as he said go and they took a foot and started that's when it started happening I don't know how long it took it to go away but as they started that's when it started that's when the healing started and that last paragraph I like this paragraph because as I said what kind of healing do we want a simple lesson here is that faith that resulted in obedience to leading to healing first off they had to obey and we don't always obey, but they had to obey. That's the first step. And so the first step of obeying was to go. 
for the ten men out of our text. This was a physical healing. All ten of them got healed. There is no question in that. They all got a physical healing. Okay? And we also get physical healings. But we also want, want other kind of healing. We want a spiritual healing because we want our last, when we draw our last breath here, we want to be present where? In his arms, in his, right in front of his face, so to speak, in his presence, however you want to say that. So look what the rest of it says. For us it may be a spiritual healing, a cleansing of our unclean hearts, that we obediently follow Jesus. Do we have leprosy? No. But do we have sin? Do we have unclean hearts? Then we got to get it, we got to get the heart clean. So we're kind of in the same boat as these ten men. And then let's see what happens in verse 15 and 16. Because this is where Jesus turns the story around with a little twist. Um, Debbie, do you mind reading those two verses? And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So one man's heart drove him to respond in ways that did not attribute to the other nine. So what were those ways? Well, first, he delayed his trip to the priest as he turned back to Jesus. He declared uh, to, be de to be declared clean by a priest was trumped by his desire to show gratitude. Mary said in her prayer, and I titled my lesson, we are to give thanks. Even in the bad times, we are to give thanks. Because you know what? He's still there with us. I watched the preacher, and he titled his lesson, Where is God? And he says, God is right there with you in the, in the ordeal that you are going through, or that we are going through. Let me change it to we. Because we all go through ordeals. And where is God? If we are a child of his, he is right there in that ordeal. So he's still with us. All right, so the first point, he wanted to show gratitude. He was very, very grateful. Second, he cried in the loudest voice. You can only imagine what the man said. I mean, he has seen this leprosy dissolve off his skin. I mean, he's on cloud nine. He's happy as a lark, so to speak. Third, this really gets it. Do we do what he does? Sometimes. He fell down at Jesus' feet which was an extreme posture of submission that was only appropriate to God. So when he says, when they say master back there, they're saying more than teacher. Because remember the, even the, the ruler, I looked that up, the ruler, he wanted, he said, what can I do to get inherit, in, in eternal life? And Jesus told him what? Go and sell everything. Because he calls him master also. You can find this, there's other scripture reference with the word master in it. And he couldn't sell everything. So Jesus wants them to know more than just am I a teacher, I'm doing good works. I'm also God in the flesh. So that's why I say I think that term has, uh, that word master can also, well, it's related to God. It's not my thinking, it is related to God. So he does these three things. And it says he's mourning. I mean, he's not, he's not crying anymore. He's not mourning. He doesn't have a death sentence. He's got life. He's got uh, a fellowship with all the people he ever knew. So his mourning was transformed into spontaneous praise for the one who brought God's healing to him as he gave thanks. Because the healing, of course, Jesus prayed or whatever to the Father first, but it came through whom? Who did the speaking? Of course, Jesus is still God. I realize that too. But in this case, the third part, the one part of the Trinity, it was Jesus in the flesh, and he spoke, and he recognizes this is God. goes on to say, one thing the man knew. This is what he knew. Jesus had been God's instrument in his healing. The man had, had been shown mercy. He asked for mercy back there. They all asked for mercy. He has now been shown mercy. So here's your question. What is the nature of worship? Or war is worship. Look at those last two sentences. We glorify God for who He is, extolling His revealed attributes. And Mary said that in her prayer. He is good, even when we're in bad times. God is still good. God is always good. God is love. We know that. He so loved the world, He gave us Jesus, His Son, so we could have a restored relationship. God is compassion. 
He had compassion on these men. He healed them. He had compassion on that woman who touched his garment. She was healed instantly where doctors couldn't help her. And you can name others um, throughout. He is creator. I sit on the back porch this morning just watch the squirrels eat and the birds eat and everything out in the yard and listen to all this and look at this view, blue sky. Does God deserve praise? Oh, yes, he does. You think you got masterpiece like Rembrandt or Mona Lisa? I got news for you. God is a better painter. Yes. Much better painter. And I like all four seasons too. So, I asked you what is worship? We glorified God and Mary started to praise her, her prayer off. We need to praise him before we start asking for all these things. Because who is he? He is create, creator. He is almighty God. He is the great I am. He is my rock. My strength. There's some beautiful words in Psalms that you can that is read throughout. And then I was reading Solomon's prayer and, and what he he praises God for who God is. And he didn't just sacrifice one animal, he sacrificed a thousand animals to show what God had done when they had built the temple. And then this is the next part of worship. We thank God for what he has done in providing the blessings that we personally enjoy. Before we ask for something, we need to thank him for who he is. But guess what? He knows what we need before we ask, right? And it tells us we don't know how to ask. The Holy Spirit will intercede for us. And the Holy Spirit is also God. So God is interceding for God on our behalf. But this part here is the twist of the whole story. As Paul Harvey would always say, now you know the rest of the story. It's like, I don't know the rest of the story. So the shocking twist is... The only one that came back to thank him out of these ten men was a Samaritan. The most hated person that the Jews had at that time. That's who came back to show gratitude. He returned. And then once he did, he will go to the priest. So God doesn't see us as Jew or Samaritan. Instead, he sees sick people like these men with leprosy or any other uncleanness. God sees us as sinners in need of a healing, sick with sin that keeps us apart from his presence. Like these lepers, we too need a touch from the master, and I'm using that term from God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus sees no barrier or outcasts, only people in need of a Savior. As Jesus asked the questions in verse 17, Were thou not ten cleansed, where are the nine? We can also reflect on what Jesus has asked. How grateful are we when we are blessed? Do we give Jesus thanks and worship? Or do we go away like the other nine that didn't? Sylvia, do you want to read 18 and 19? Okay. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this strange. And he said unto them, Arise and go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. We find in verse 18 that the one who did come back was a non-Jew, a stranger. This was a rebuke to the Jews who, of all people, should have accepted, should have realized and knew who Jesus was. They had seen miracles. They had seen the dove once he was baptized to sin. They heard his voice. So they should have known without a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. And they should have known what his mission was. But they didn't. They did not recognize it. So Jesus kind of rebukes them for just a little bit right here with that. Relationship is the key on this relationship. The relationship is what we have with God personally not what our ancestors had with God. And basically putting it another way, we can't ride somebody else's coattails to heaven. We gotta walk our own path, make our own acceptance, invite him into our heart, and then everything else can fall into place. But just because a, a parent or a grandparent or somebody you knew uh, was a great Christian saint, that's great, but that's not gonna get us there. It's a personal relationship. And what they were seeing here, even though they saw all this, they were relying on ancestral uh, 
his history instead of making a personal relationship. It goes on to say, after posing his rhetorical question, because they, they were rhetorical, and you really don't answer a rhetorical question, okay? And he posed that just so all those around could hear, because he's still got 12 disciples that need to get grounded, because he hasn't left yet. Remember, this is he's in his third year of ministry, so he's going to Jerusalem for the last time. And so he's got to get them grounded. Um, Jesus returned to the Samaritan. All the men were healed by faith. So all ten were healed. There's no doubt in that. And they were healed by faith. But only this singular Samaritan received affirmation. And this is what we want to hear. Not only do we have faith in God, but my faith has made me whole. And we've talked about being made whole, and I'll just say it down here again. Being made whole is another way of saying being saved. Um, and we have, we have studied that previously in our lessons. We saw that in lesson two. We used that phrase, being, being made whole. Also, that woman with the issue of blood, she was made whole instantly. And then also we saw that in lesson three. So Jesus offered physical healing to some. It had to be expected by faith. He offered salvation from sins to all. It also had to be expected by faith. Like I said, his first word to these men were what? Go. If they had turned away and went around like, I, you're not going to touch me, you're not going to do anything else for me. Would they have been healed? No. They had to obey what he said, and he said go. And as they started, and I thought, well, he said go, but the guy stopped and came back and thanked Jesus, and then he went to the priest because he was already, he was healed. But he had to go to the priest to get cleansed so he could return to community. Okay. Goes on said the larger picture here that Luke is that we're talking about Luke between Luke and Acts is the Samaritans formed bridge between the Jews and the Gentiles. Luke's understanding of Jesus' plan for evangelism was for it to begin in Jerusalem and Judea, move to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Sounds like Matthew. The very end. Great commission. A complete healing. In this unit, we have focused on what Jesus teaches about faith, and the topics he touched on have included worry, fear, doubt, faith, and gratitude. When we find ourselves faced with these issues, we have key verses to help us handle and help us handle them when they arise. Worry this can distract. Counter it with Matthew 6, 32 to 33. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear can vex. Quote Matthew 8, 26. He saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye little faith? Who ye rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Doubt can paralyze. Read Matthew 14, 31. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Faith can heal. Apply Matthew 9, 22. Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Gratitude can reveal. Stand on Luke 17, 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Life doesn't get much worse than the fate of a person with leprosy in Jesus' day. Excluded from community, required to be self-degrading de in word and appearance, and destined to live with a slowly fatal and painful disease. It was a living death. Yet a heart of thankfulness survived in this Samaritan leper. God does not need our thanks, but he created us as beings who need to give thanks. The th unthankful life can become bitter and cold. The thankful heart will find peace and purpose in all circumstances. May we learn from the man who returned that even in the humblest of circumstances, there is nothing to prevent us from giving praise and thanks to God, nothing except our own selfish and stubborn hearts. May we recognize our spiritual poverty, ask God's, ask for God's mercy, and give praise and thanks when it arises.
Entendeu? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these scriptures and the lessons that Mindy has read to us today and that we should always be thankful for even the smallest thing that Jesus does for us. Lord, we ask you to go with us through the rest of these services and, and be back with us tonight as we share together to celebrate the 4th of July that was given to us by our ancestors and the freedom that we have from it. May we never forget that either. So, Lord, I just ask you to be with us. In his name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.